for joining us today. In just a moment, we're going to hear a great talk. But first, take a minute and let us know where you're watching from. As you watch today, we want you to know we've been praying for you, and we believe God is going to speak to you through today's teaching. Just a reminder, if you're ever in the Marysville area, we would love you to join us in person for church. But for now, sit back, relax, and enjoy today's teaching. Thank you for making Rock Creek a part of your spiritual growth. Hey, Rock Creek Church, Pastor Brian here. We're so glad you joined us wherever you're watching from. If you're on our YouTube channel, make sure to subscribe for all the latest content. If you're on our social media, Facebook, let us know where you're watching from, who's watching with you, and maybe the highlight of your week. Uh, Again, if you're on our app or website, make sure you download the notes. I'm gonna give you a lot of content, a lot of scripture. If you're new to Rock Creek, we always preach and teach from the Bible. And so we wanna anchor um, all the biblical truth that we've discovered today from scripture. So there's gonna be some scriptures on your fill in the notes, and I'm gonna give you some biblical concepts that I believe if you all apply to your life, not only will you be closer to Jesus, but you'll have a, a desire, a want to, to grow in your faith. And so again, we're so glad you joined us wherever you're watching from. We're in the middle of a teaching series that has been a lot of fun, talking about who told you that. The whole premise of this entire collection of talks is really to dismantle some beliefs that many of us have adopted as biblical truths, but they're actually not. And so we've been tackling some uh, cultural, trendy statements. Uh, we've been uh, talking about some, some beliefs that have kept a lot of people from experiencing all that God has for them. And so today I'm gonna flip it a little bit and then I'm gonna give you a phrase. Oh, well, let me just give it to you. Who told you that you are what you eat? You are what you eat. Now, some of you are thinking, well, that's, that's not actually not true. That, that's actually a true statement and you would be right. As my son says, you are correct. Um, That is a correct statement because actually this statement, you are what you eat, is actually true. It's actually true. It's proven now that on a healthy person, a healthy diet um, uh, that consumes things that are good for you, it produces good things in your body. And in the same way, we have either experienced it personally or experience it through someone else's life, that when you put bad things, food, substances, liquids into your body that wasn't meant to be there, it could actually have a devastating effect, whether on your heart, your vascular system, your skin, your immune, your gut health. And so we must understand this this natural image that you you are what you eat. If you live at McDonald's, you'll be going to become the guy that was in the documentary, you know, Um, every year or twice a year, actually, in our neck of the woods up here in Washington state, uh, there's fairs. One's called the Puyallup Fair, which I grew up fondly having uh, great memories at. And now we live closer to the Evergreen State Fair. And every year we think, man, this is a good idea. Let's take all the kids and we'll go because there's just one thing that I want and there's just one thing that my wife wants. And she wants a funnel cake? Come on, this like heaven uh, revival. Uh, And I want an elephant ear. And somehow we get there and we both get those things, but then we end up getting the fries that are like four pounds and and it's like a bucket. Uh, Burgers, barbecue chicken, corn on the cob. And you know, when they do corn on the cob, it's not just a little pat of butter. It's like they take the corn and they baptize that thing in butter and then pour a bunch of just cheese. And so, I mean, it's amazing. But on the ride home, something unique begins to, to happen and we begin to hear the noises of disruption and, and what that is is our bodies beginning to shout through our stomachs and other ways, why did you put all of that into me? Because you are what you eat. And so if you eat healthy things, you most likely will produce healthy outcomes. And if you go to the fair and eat a funnel cake and elephant ear and corner of the cob baptized in butter and a burger with fries and then go on rides and spend a lot of money because I got three kids, you're going to feel ill. You're going to 
feel the effects of it in every part of your body. The headache from all the MSG, the stomach ache from all the, you know, grease, and, and, and later on we'll just leave it right there, but you're, you're gonna feel the effects because actually, who told you that? You are what you eat is actually true. And I think what's interesting about this conversation we're gonna have today is that actually, there is a spiritual connection to this thought that you are what you eat. You are what you eat. Let's read our theme scripture today and it'll make more sense as we kind of dive into the uh, Bible today together. Ezekiel says this, the voice said to me, son of man, eat what I am giving you. Eat this scroll. He hears, then go and give its message to the people of Israel. So I opened my mouth and he fed me the scroll. Fill your stomach with this, he said. And when I ate it, it tasted as sweet as honey in my mouth. So we have this amazing, what we know him to be as a prophet or someone who spoke on behalf of God to the people of God. Ezekiel had a unique ministry in that oftentimes what he would say or speak on behalf of God was not received, but it was often rejected. And so there was a lot of conflict, uh, inner conflict in Ezekiel, in his ministry. And so we see this, this vision, this moment he has, this, you know, some believe it to be a, a, a Christophany where Jesus kind of pre-incarnate shows up on the scene and goes, hey, this is what I want you to do, eat. Eat what I'm giving you. Eat the scroll. Then go and give that message to the people of Israel. And so he sees himself consuming what, what we see in scripture as the scroll. And so back in those days when they wrote scripture, they wrote it on parchment, oftentimes on a single side, but we see this moment where his, his vision became reality. Eat, eat, the, eat the word, eat the scroll, eat the scripture, and, and then give my word to the people. Ezekiel's like, wow, it tastes like honey. Now, I don't know if you ever had pure honey. We have a, a, a sweet fam in our church that's owned a farm for a while, and every year we get their, their, their honey from their bees on their farm, and I'm telling you, you think the honey in the little bear bottle was good? This, 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 this takes the cake and makes a good cake, right? So, so Ezekiel's having this moment where, where he's going, okay, I need to get the word in me, and then, I, and, then, and then it'll get out of me, and when he's consuming God's word, it was sweet to him. It, it, was, it was well-pleasing to him. It wasn't funnel cakes and elephant ears, right? It, it was something that actually was good for him, and he's like, man, it was sweet. Now, what's interesting about this sweet idea when it comes to God's word is that we see this kind of imagery throughout the Bible specifically in the book of Psalms where, where oftentimes the psalmist or David who wrote a lot of the Psalms would re reference and refer to God's word, also known as the Bible. There's an Old and New Testament. If you don't have a Bible, we'd love to get one to you. It's referred to this idea of the word of God tastes a certain way. Look what it says in Psalm 119. How sweet your words taste to me. They are sweeter than honey. So we see this imagery, and I don't have time to go through all of them, but there's literally so many scriptures and, and, and references to this idea that God's word to us tastes like heaven. It tastes like sweet. It, it, it's just, it's good for the soul because you are, come on, what you eat. And so I want to discover together today a way to live your life, not naturally, because before you are human, you have a spirit. There is a natural way to, to experience you are what you eat, and then there's a spiritual way to experience you are what you eat. So, so, so let me just start by saying this. How do we know what to do with this life? How do we discover God's purpose for us? I think it's the age old question, on, what am I here on planet Earth to do? How do I know if I'm doing what God wants me to? Let me give you the truth to live by. 
Okay, God's word is God's will. So, so when Ezekiel was having this moment, he's like, eat the scroll, eat the word, consume it. He's like, man, it tastes good. And, and the psalmist, David is saying, hey, by the way, the word of God is sweet. It tastes like heaven. It's good. Well, if God's word is good, it tastes good, it's good for you, then we must also understand that God's word is God's will. So whether you're a longtime veteran Christian or you have no faith and you're just exploring what it could mean to have a relationship with Jesus and possibly a community to call home like a church and you're trying to figure all this out, you're trying to navigate it, let me just tell you, if you wanna know what God's will is for your life, it's God's word for your life and the good news, unlike the funnel cakes and the elephant ears and the burgers and fries at the fair, because you are what you eat. The word of God, it tastes good. It changes you, it transforms you, it makes you healthy. Because spiritually, come on, you are what you eat. You are what you eat. So as the prophet Ezekiel heard, eat the word. Eat God's word. Not literally, okay, this isn't some and you know, cultish, grab the paper Bible and begin, no, no, but consume it, eat it, just like get after it, because you are, spiritually speaking now, what you consume, what you eat. Luke 2 Timothy 3.16 says about God's word, all scripture is inspired by God, and it's useful to do what? To teach us, to teach us what? What is true, and also is to make us realize what, when we get it wrong, get it wrong where? In our lives. Now, now don't poke the person next to you watching, but this is personal day. Makes us realize what's wrong in our lives. It, it corrects us when we are wrong and teaches us to do what is right. So eat the word, Ezekiel. It tastes sweet. The psalmist, hey, the word of God in my life, it, it tastes, it's like honey. It's like the best bee honey from a farm that hasn't been messed with. It's natural, it hasn't been passionate. It is raw and it is healthy and it is sweet. That, that's scripture. It's inspired by God. It's useful, that means it's, 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 it's a part of our everyday faith. It teaches us. When we get things right, let me say it this way, it teaches us what is right. We always say it around our church, and maybe you're new to Rock Creek, but God's word, right here, is the guardrails for our life. L let me say it a little bit deeper. The Bible was not written to us, but it was written for us. So the Bible was written in a very specific time period inspired by God with a bunch of human authors, but under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, without error, best-selling book of all time, mo most doubted book, but the most proven truth book. And, and so it is the guardrails of our life. It is God's will for our life. You wanna know what God's word is for you? It's his will for you. You wanna hear God speak to you, a great pastor, Mark Batterson says it this way, when you open your Bible, God opens his mouth. Think about it. Why won't God, I just, you know, you say God speaks to you all the time. He does right here, right here. 99.9% .9 when God speaks to me and God is gonna speak to you, it's through his word. It's through the Bible, both old and new. Not one is better than the other. You need both, the old and the new. The old shows us our need for a savior, and the New Testament reveals who is that savior. And now we, how we ought, ought to orient our life around the person of Jesus. So you wanna hear God speak? Then open up your Bible, because God will declare, God will direct, and you will discover like Ezekiel did, man, the word of God, it tastes good. The psalmist, oh man, God's word is better than honey. Throughout the Bible, we see many great people reference and talk about the word of God. Here it is in Job, Job 23. 
I have not departed from his commands, he says, but I have treasured his words more than daily food. Think about this. Now, I like to eat, you know, and every year in January we do prayer and fasting. As my mentor, pastor growing up used to say, fasting is good, but eating is better. So, so this isn't against eating regular food, okay? But eventually we're gonna fast together and it's good for your body to tell yourself no. But, but Job says, hey, I've eaten some good food, but the word of God, whoo, it's better. It's better than red lobster. It's better than all you can eat, Olive Garden. It's better than Cheesecake Factory. It's better than some Ruth's Chris. And I've been there with a gift card and it's pretty good. And, and, and he says, it's better than daily food. God's word, it's life to me. Cause you are what you eat. David in the book of Psalm, says it this way, I take joy in doing your will, my God, for your instructions are written on my heart. So again, we see this imagery of this internalization of God's word being on the inside of us. The only way to get it on the inside is you gotta consume it, you gotta eat it, you gotta devour it. And David says, hey, I've experienced it, I've eaten, it's like honey, and it's gotten on the inside, and it it has affected my organs, my heart. And in those days, the heart was was the whole of who a person was. And so whatever was going on the heart affected the outside. One of my favorite scriptures, Proverbs 4, says this, guard your heart above all else. Why? Because it affects your whole life. And so David says, I have, I have taken joy in doing your will because why? Your, your word, your instructions, your commands, they're, they're in my heart. Jeremiah, another great prophet who spoke on behalf of God says it this way, when I discovered your words, I devoured them. They are my joy. And here it is, my heart's delight. When I discovered your word, I devoured them, I consumed them. I ate the word, I ate the scroll. Not physically, but, but, but spiritually. Why? Because the natural re- reflects the spiritual. Let me say this, the spiritual reflects the natural. You are what you eat. Even Jesus says it in Matthew 4. But Jesus told him, him being Satan, as he's being tempted to do contrary to God's word. No, 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 the scriptures say, people do not live by bread alone, but by every, here it is, word that comes from the mouth of God. So Jesus is straight rebuking the devil who's trying to tempt him to go against God's word. He's like, no, no, don't get it twisted, Satan. People don't live by natural food alone. It's good, but it's not what's best. What's best is that you get a word from God. What's best is that you can can start to consume the word. Because that comes straight from God. You want to hear God speak, then, then open up your Bible. And he'll tell you what you need to know. He'll, he'll show you what his will is for your life. Because why? The word of God is the will of God for our life who claim to follow Christ. And so when Ezekiel got this moment, eat the scroll, eat what I'm going to give you. See, the, the, I think the problem with a lot of well-meaning Christians but have gotten things a little bit jumbled is that they don't eat what God gives them, they just eat whatever they want. Like me at the fair, I'm like, let's have some funnel cake. Let's have some elephant ear. Let's have some three pounds of deep fried french fries and wash it down with some Diet Coke because it just feels more healthy. And then the rumbly tumbly on the ride home begins. See, we got a lot of emaciated Christians starving Malnutrition Christians walking around unhealthy spiritually because they're not eating what God gave them, they're eating whatever they want. So we eat a little self-help guru podcast, we eat a little self-help you know, spa time and therapy sessions and we, we have a little medicine on, and again, there's nothing wrong with some of those things on the surface, but, but, it, but we gotta eat what God gives us right here. We eat the word. Not the latest quote on social media to inspire you to work harder and do better. No, 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 friend, eat what he gives us. Consume what he gives us. Come on, he's made a meal for us. Let's devour it together because even Jesus understood we don't, we don't live by natural food alone. 
We, we live by every word that comes from the mouth of God because we are faith people. We are spiritual people. We're not just physical human body people. And, and so as he comes back to Ezekiel, again, we see it continue in chapter three, verse 10 and 11. Son of man, let all my words sink deep into your own heart first. Listen to them carefully for yourself. Then go to your people in exile and say to them, this is what the sovereign Lord says. Do this whether they listen to you or not. Think about it. Eat the, eat the scroll, Ezekiel. Eat the word. Oh man, I'm going to. And he, and he took what was given to him by God, consumed it, and it was, it was good. It was healthy because you are what you eat. But here's the truth. You got to eat something before you can give something. So he tells them, hey, hey, make sure the word of God goes deep in your soul before you tell others about it. And I think a lot of us as Christians are ineffective and unfruitful in making disciples that is followers of Jesus. Why? Because we have not allowed God's meal he's prepared for us. God's word he's given us to go deep into our soul first before we try to go out into the world and give them what we should have but don't have. Because too many of us are eating what we what we want, not what God wants to give us. So I just want to propose an idea, a thought, a biblical truth that I think if you'll live by and discover and let it guide you, it'll change everything about you, spiritually speaking. Because the reality is, what you feed on, you'll be hungry for. What you consume, most often, you'll be hungry for. I wish an elephant ear could be like a nice crisp kale salad. It can't. It, it, it does not transform molecules. I mean, I know that we believe a God who does the miraculous, but I'm not even sure God would take an elephant ear and help you become a kale salad. Like, I just, I just don't think that's how it works. So you got to be careful because what you feed on, you'll be hungry for, naturally speaking, and so it is spiritually. What are you feeding your soul? Is it the news? Is it social media? Is it a, a, a best friend? Is it the latest uh, podcast? Is it the latest Netflix or Hulu show? Is it the latest Bachelorette or Bachelor? Like, come on, what are you feeding on? Because that's what you'll have an appetite for. That's what you'll be hungry for. That's what you'll desire. And so I wanna propose to you that if you'll begin to devour and experience that the word of God is sweet, and better than honey, you'll be hungry for it. But if you never taste and see that the Lord is good, if you never taste and see that God's word is beautiful, it's, it's satisfying, it fills your soul, it starts on the inside and works, you'll never be hungry for it. Because who told you you are what you eat? And the reality of that statement is they were, they were right. This one, they got it right. You are exactly what you eat naturally, and you are exactly what you consume and devour spiritually. You want more of God? You want God to speak to you? Then get into his word, because it's his will for your life. It's the guardrails of your life. It's how you Manage everything about your life. And if you begin to feed and devour and intentionally curate space for God to speak, and when he does, 99% of the time, it's through his word, you'll begin to, to have an appetite for it. But in order to do this, there's some things that we must establish in our life in order to get there. Because no one who steps in the faith for the first time or maybe today for the first time in a long time goes, yeah, let's just get after it because it can be challenging. It, it, it can cause some friction. It can be confusing. And I always describe the Bible sometimes, it's kind of like Star Wars. It's written out of order and there's the prequel before the sequel and it's a lot of interesting conversations and lineage and heritage and you know brothers and sisters i mean it's like it's the perfect analogy of the bible is star wars it's just it could be a bit confusing if you start at the end and even though the first part wasn't done yet 
But in order to get to a place where you desire and devour God's word, I think the first thing we all must establish is that we must accept its authority for our life. Because if it is not the authoritative true north of your life, then, then there's no point in learning how to discover God speaking through his word. And so I wanna propose to you as a Christian, the primary source of truth for you is God's word. It is God's will. It is the guardrails of your life. And so whatever you experience has to be compared to, looked at, in light of scripture. So if scripture says this, but your experience is that, I wanna to propose to you, scripture transcends and supersedes what you experience. So if it's, if it's in the word, we can experience it. If it's outside of it, we must be careful to go, is that godly? Is that God's best for us? And in order for us to live a life where God's Word becomes his will and the guardrails for our life is we must first accept its authority. Second Timothy says this, work hard so you can present yourself to God and receive his approval. Be a good worker, he says, one who does not need to be ashamed and one who correctly explains the word of truth. Which is why if you're watching today, you need to be in a Bible believing, Bible teaching church. Why, because if it's God's will for your life and it's the guardrails in which you function within, like banks to a river, or the bumpers when you go bowling, right? Come on, so there's no gutter balls, but you're just winning that life. That's what God wants for you. And so you better be in a, a Bible-believing, Bible-teaching community where you can learn how to correctly explain and discover the word of truth, which is scripture, the Bible, old and new. Not throwing out the old, but, but we're examining and holding both intention together as the perfect story, narrative. Not written to us, but written for us. And so once we establish that the Bible is our authority for our life, it's the true north, it's the compass in which we use to, to navigate this world in which we live, then we must do what I call assimilate its truths. The word assimilate means to create a habit or, 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 or practice or routine or, 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 or really a pattern in our life. So, so the word of God, if it is the authority in our life, then we must assimilate it. We must let it become a routine that we view life through, that we uh, go to for God to speak to us. So patterns and habits and routines, we must assimilate the truths. And there's a few ways in which I've discovered on best practice in doing this. So the first one is by, by reading it. You gotta read it. I know some of us were like, oh man, that sounds like a lot of work. Yeah, it is. But if you wanna know God, you gotta read it. If you wanna get to know your spouse more, what? You gotta read them, you, you gotta talk to them, you gotta, you gotta, you gotta let them open their mouth. And God's opening his mouth, you just gotta open up the book. John 20 says it this way. But these are written so that you may continue to believe that Jesus is the Messiah. These things are written so that you continue to believe that Jesus is who he said. He's the son of God. And by believing in him, you'll have the power of his name. So you become his followers by believing what was written. But if you never read it, how do you know what it says? And the next part of assimilating the truth is by reviewing it. That means you're thinking about it. You're, you're, you're taking a moment to go, what does this mean for my life? What does this have to do? If it wasn't written to us, but it was written for us, then, then what is the for that I need more of? Psalm 119 says it this way, I have hidden your word, where, where have I hidden it? In my heart. That I might not, what, sin against you? That I might live my life in such a way that reflects the fact that I have faith, that I have a relationship with Jesus, that I am a follower, that I am a son or daughter of God, that I've been adopted into the family. I've hidden it in my heart. Well, you can't hidden it in your heart unless you're thinking about it, unless you're wondering, what does this have to do with me? What is this for in my life? Psalm 119, one of my favorite chapters in all of the book of Psalm, continues on in verse 96 and seven says this, even perfection has its limits, but your commands, they have none. 
Oh, how I love your instructions. And I think about them all day long. Now this is a challenge I think for all of us, including me, because there's not a lot of things I think about all day long. Very few actually, it's probably a short list. My wife, golf, I know you're probably thinking your children, but, but, but n- n- not, not typically, and, and, and then God, <laughs> when I get it right. But, but the psalmist is telling us, hey, perfection, pfft, it has its limits. But your word, whoo, I love it. I devour it. I eat it. I consume it. I discover it. I review it, thinking about what does this have to do for my life? And I don't just do it once in a while, I do it throughout the day. You wanna assimilate God's truth and I think you gotta reflect on it. Reflect on it, that means you go, okay, what, how do I work this out? Colossians 3.16 says it this way, let the message about Christ in all its riches fill your lives Teach and counsel each other with all the wisdom he gives. Sing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs to God with thankful hearts. Let this message about Christ in all its richness, in all its fullness, in all its depth and beauty and splendor, what? Fill your life. Which means you're thinking about it. The word actually is mutter or meditate on God's word where you're just pondering it. What is this, what am I supposed to do with this now? God spoke to me through his word, now I'm wrestling with what to do with it. First Timothy 4.15 says it this way, give your complete attention to these matters. Throw yourself into your task so that everyone will see your progress. See, if you wanna assimilate the truths of God's word, you first must establish that it's the authority of your life. And then once you do, you must read it. You must review it. What does this mean for me? And you gotta reflect on it. Now, now, where do I go from here? So I thought it was a beautiful exercise for those of you who may not have participated in an exercise like this before. I thought I would just help you walk through a single scripture in what it looks like to assimilate the truth of God's word for our life by reading it, reviewing it, and reflecting on it. So Romans 8 verse 31 says, what shall we say about such wonderful things as these? If God is for us, who can ever be against us? Great scripture, one of my favorites of all times. The title in this passage in the scripture in the book of Romans is this, nothing can separate us from God's love. And so if it's about assimilating God's truth into your life, let me just teach for just a brief moment on how this looks practically for us. You read your Bible, I want a word from God, I'm gonna eat it, I'm gonna consume it, I'm gonna let it get in my heart to affect the outside of my life, okay. The first thing, you gotta read it, and we read it, nothing can separate us from God's love, okay, that's what this section's gonna be about. And then we read it, what shall we say about such wonderful things as these? If God is for us, who can ever be against us? So this is where I begin, okay? I have this thought, okay, so so if nothing can separate us from God's love, then what does it mean to separate? What means to break apart? It means to to get a divorce, to to go our separate ways. It means we're no longer one. So as you're thinking about and reading it and and now reviewing it, okay, so so nothing will separate us. Nothing nothing will break me apart or divorce me or or separate me from from God's love. Well, what is God's love? I highlighted it for you so you see it. It's the no strings attached, unshakable, never ending. So as you're reading your Bible, this is what it looks like to assimilate the truth. It's asking questions. What does this have to do for me? That's the review. And then you reflect on it. Well, separate, and you define these terms, and and then you go on to the next part, and so I did a little highlighting for you. What shall we say about such wonderful things? Well then, who is the we? Followers of Jesus. That's, That's you and I, if you have claimed Christ as your savior, if you recede to the new life that only he promises, then the shall we say is the followers of Jesus. Say what? Say means you have to be vocal about what God is doing in your life. What shall we say? What should the followers of Jesus say? Well, you gotta use your words. Wonderful things, what is that? 
What has he done for you? Has he saved you? I wrote that down. Has he healed you? Has he forgiven you? Has he made you new? Are you a child of God? Those are wonderful things. That is the reflection. That is the review of. That's how you assimilate truths from God's word into your life. But but let's go a little deeper. If God is for us, who could ever be against us? Well, what is God? God is all powerful. He's all knowing. He's everywhere. Well, what does for us mean? Well, Jeremiah 29, because I'm bringing in some more of God's word, says this, I have a future filled with hope. So he's for us, that's what it means, that when God is for us, who's all knowing, all powerful, and everywhere at once, is for us, that means that, that I have a future that's filled with hope. No matter what I'm facing or the challenges I'm going through, I have a future filled with hope. Well, well, who can ever be against us? That means that there's gonna be challenges in your life because he's reminding you, hey, there will be people against us, but, but don't be afraid, don't be concerned, don't be worried because, because God is for you. And if he's for you, no matter what you face, he's with you. Which ultimately, here's my final reflective thought. No matter what I've done, God made a way for me. And his name is Jesus. This is what it looks like. It's a little messy. It's my handwriting that we put on digital. And it just, this is what it looks like to assimilate God's truth every day in your life. But you don't do this unless it's the authority of your life. But then you gotta assimilate it by reading it, reviewing it, and reflecting on it. And ultimately, we must apply its principles to our life. It's not believed, it's not truth, unless it affects how you live. It's not truth, it's not what you believe unless it affects how you live. And so you must take that which you believe to be God's will for you, guardrails for you, read it, review it, reflect on it, establish that it's actually authoritative for your life, it's the final say, it's the true north, and and now, okay, I wanna live it out, I wanna look differently. James 1.22 tells us, but don't just listen to God's word, you must do what it says, otherwise you're only fooling yourselves. So the prayer is this, Holy Spirit, help me look more like Jesus by living out your truth. By living out your truth. Because who told you, who told you that you are what you eat? And they were right this time. Are you consuming God's word? Are you devouring God's word? Because it's sweet like honey and it will change you from the inside out. Would you pray with me? God, I thank you for every single person watching. I pray for those that have been struggling in the area of faith. I pray that today, God, you would meet them. They would have an encounter with you. If you're not a Christian, you're watching today, I would love to lead you to prayer that for the first time or maybe the first time in a long time, you can confess Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. And so if that's you watching today, I wanna lead you in a prayer and you can simply pray after me. Today, Jesus, I acknowledge I'm in need of a, of a saving. I'm in need of a rescue. I'm in need of forgiveness. So today I put my faith and trust and my life in your hands. Forgive me, take my life and make it new. From this day forward, I'm following you and you alone. In your mighty name we pray, Jesus, amen. I wanna thank you so much for joining us. If you prayed that prayer, I'd love to know that you did. Look for the link for next steps. Listen, no one makes the most important decision of their life and then doesn't keep walking out those decisions. So let us know how we can help you walk those out. Also, there's an opportunity for you to partner with us financially. Love for you to prayerfully consider on what your part to play is in the story that God is writing here at Rock Creek. You can look for the link. And as always, Rock Creek Church, you're doing better than you think. God bless.